And we're recording. Great. Um, yeah, hi. Um, I'm happy to be here. I got contacted like two days ago that uh, some speaker uh, couldn't attend, so they were going through the submissions and were like, hey, Bastian, you're anyways registered. Would you like to have a talk? And I was like, yeah, sure, we can do that. Um, my talk will be uh, about open source, um, some challenges when like your daily work happens in the, op um, in the open, some benefits, and basically also a recap on the nearly two years of us working, doing open source um, like in the open and like all the nitty gritty details that you need to think about when you do that. A little bit about me, uh, I'm Bastian. I uh, live in Zurich. Uh, I work at the Macy IO as a system engineer. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Das Recht or you can find me at one of those uh, events where I I'm also helping, that's like the Winter Congress of the Digital Society Switzerland, or the DevOps Days, or the Community Rack, or TEDx Burn. So, let's do a little um, test here. So, put your hand up if you use any of those open source softwares to build a product. So, Drupal. Composer, MariaDB, Redis. Okay, now I got everybody. Great. Usually I take, I go on for a little bit, and then yeah, I go with Linux, and then every hand at least is up, uh, is up. So, let's agree, open source software in today's world is everywhere. It can be in your toaster. It is most likely in your toaster when it has uh, IoT uh, connection, but it's really everywhere. Um, so let's try something else. Who is a contributor to an open source project? That's great. Yeah, yeah, you are also. <laughs> so yeah, thank you for your time and your commitment because most of the time you don't get any money from doing that work. So this is really cool and it shows that you can create some value with just contributing back, whatever this contributing back is. So let me talk a little bit about Amazi.io. Um, Amazi.io is a hosting platform, or we built Lagoon, which is a hosting platform for Drupal sites, but not just Drupal sites. We can also run WordPress or whatever else you might want to run on our platform. Um, we're part of the Amazi group, so it's part of a larger net of companies. Currently, we are around 11 employees. And the core team does hosting services since more than eight years now. So we really know like high traffic sites and high performance sites, what it needs, like all the preparations that go into it. Um, and we are a completely remote team. So you probably saw the talk of Michael before. Um, everybody thinks Michael like is it still in Switzerland, but actually he lives in the States now as I'm currently the only person in the Central Europe time zone that keeps the, the company going, but we have many more people around the world to basically do the 24-7 shifts. Um, we're currently doing hosting in 16 different countries, and we can do hosting either in the cloud or on-premises with the customer. So let me shortly skip that. So, Lagoon itself does a lot of things. Um, when, it, uh, when you want to deploy something, uh, you can deploy from your local site and basically build everything in with Docker containers. We give you the base set of Docker containers already, and you can build the exact same uh, environment as you will have locally <coughs> will be built when you push it. So it's basically, you build it locally, you commit it, Lagoon is connected to your Git repository, and then it starts building the whole thing. A little bit more details here. You see, like, you have the Docker Compose file. It talks uh, via webhooks to Lagoon. It starts building with when you need to have two databases. You just say, I need two database containers, and it starts doing everything like that. Um, but I really want to focus about the open source parts. So why did we go open source? So, Michael said that in one of our blog posts, 
so that we basically looked at the whole ecosystems and how Drupal sites are hosted. And it kind of troubled us to see that, like we have, we build up on a lot of open source software and the hosting layer is also always something that's kind of proprietary and you cannot really see into it. And if you want to basically find or like need to uh, look at security stuff, you need to do a, um, a security audit, but it's really like just probing something you can see. You're always probing a black box. So let's look at conventional hosting stacks. So when we look at conventional hosting stacks, you always have like the CMS, for example, now Drupal, which is open source. Then we have the hosting platform where we don't know what's really, what's the secret sauce, how it's built. Then we have PHP, which is open source. You have either Nginx or Apache, also an open source project. And it goes down until the Linux kernel where you can basically have the source code ready. You can do changes and everything is open source. And what we really targeted is to go into the the proprietary layer of saying the hosting platform, like the whole automation around it, the configurations, shouldn't really be something proprietary. So with Lagoon, that hosting layer, the automation is also open source. So if somebody of our customers mentions, hey, there is something broken, it should, for example, the cron chops on the development environments don't work. I can say, yeah, we can, we can look into that. So they create a ticket and we can also some customers just go in and say, I found the code, it's there, it's wrong, can you fix that? And we can basically collaborate even on our core systems. So with Lagoon, everything is open source. And this goes through the whole thing. So if you check out the Git repository and if you have an OpenShift that you can deploy into, you can basically run Lagoon within like one or two hours yourself. Um, so it's all Docker images, all configurations. So we even like have the varnish configuration where we use, or which we use for really high traffic sites. That's all in the open, so everybody can benefit from what we, what work was put into those configurations over the year. All the build deploy scripts, even the testing infrastructure. The testing happens via Jenkins, and it's just a, like a Jenkins job in a file, which you basically strap onto a Jenkins server, and it starts testing the whole thing, and to complete documentation. So one mantra that we, we always go by is, if we have an open source tool, like if something exists out there, we will use it. We will not try to reinvent the wheel. That's why we're using, uh, for the, all the authentication, we use Keycloak, which is an open source project that helps us doing um, single sign-on across the platform. So you can log in through the UI to the same um, infrastructure, you can go to the logs via the same authentication infrastructure. And it was just like, we didn't want to have the burden of reinventing a whole single sign-on infrastructure. That would be a di whole different realm of a project. <laughs> so what are we using? So the whole thing bases up on OpenShift. Uh, OpenShift uses Kubernetes. We use not everywhere, but mostly Alpine Linux Docker images because they are very small and they are really good and maintained. We use MariaDB. Uh, we went away from uh, MySQL a few years ago and MariaDB is e pretty easy to um, operate as a high availability option. Um, we use a lot of Redis. We have the front ends are built in Node.js. We have Elasticsearch for the whole logging infrastructure and many, 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 many more projects. It's really hard to list all of that by now, but that's basically what it is. So nearly two years ago, we did a very interesting thing. We were at the point where we basically said, hey, today is the day where we want to open source Lagoon. So we went in scrolled down in GitHub and open sourced the whole thing. And then everybody of the team was like, oh yeah, what happened afterwards? Like everybody was stoked that we can finally open source the whole thing. And yeah, this happened. We were there and like, yeah, we're open source now. Yay. Actually the world is not really wait was not really waiting for us to be open source. It was like, yeah, that's fine. 
cool. I can now look at the configurations. That's cool. Um, so we really needed to do a lot of talking because a lot of people were like, yeah, that's fine, but I don't really care if, if it's open source or not. We had discussions like that. Your code is open source now, so isn't that insecure? Um, first answer, no. Uh, we apply the principle of many eyes. You also see that when you are looking at the whole security around Drupal, the more people that can look at code or have an inten incentive to look at the code and think about what are the security things, the more secure code can get. Um, and the other thing is, that's like the question is usually asked by big enterprise customers, where they sign a contract with their vendor that they have a secure system and it's bug free. And I saw one of those contracts and it was like, yeah, but they certify us, it's bug free, it will not crash. Like, yeah, it's still software. Um, and with open source software, you can basically also benefit from public money. So probably you remember the, um, or I hope you remember, the critical uh, Drupal remote, remote execution bug that came out a few weeks. That was one bug that was discovered under the EU FOSSA program. So the EU FOSSA program is amazing because it's around 90,000 euros that are basically in a pot for people to find bugs. And if they find bugs and the maintainers say, yes, it's a bug, it's a critical one, the person reporting the bug gets a share of this pot. So it's really cool. You will not get that in a closed source program. In a closed source program, it's more like, yep, we will fix that in a version. I mean, we see now, like, open source or closed source, we have bugs that are there since, like, years, and they haven't been fixed. But my core belief is that if it's open source, it can get fixed faster because you have more people that can <coughs> help solving it. And it's not just somebody that worked on the project a few years ago. So the other thing is, like, but your project is free, your product is free. <laughs> How are you going to make money? Um, it all comes down to trust and transparency for us. Um, as Michael explained, we have very close connections with our customers. We share Slack channels, we make sure connect, uh, like the communication flows freely and we can solve issues as fast as possible and as transparent as possible when they arise. For example, for the, um, for the Drupal patch that dropped a few weeks ago, we went in and built scripts with, during the night to basically check every customer site if it's affected, and we notified every customer, hey, you still need to patch your site. And we were like, the tonality was like, you need to patch your site because we think you just have a few hours until the exploit is weaponized. And at some point we saw that there are attacks coming in and we were just like, okay, what are we doing now? So we decided that when we can fix basically it by just disabling the module and it's not used, we were just doing that. So it's like trying to make sure everybody's safe. And it comes also to transparency. As every, like who, who runs an IT project that has no issues at all? Okay. You do? Okay. So... Everybody, everybody fucks up every once in a while. You drop a database, you crash your database cluster, you have a maintenance that doesn't go as planned, and the pods, the containers are not scheduled you properly. Huh? You, you, your credit card runs out oh, on Amazon. That's, that's Better. That's um, so we try, if something happens, to always like be as transparent as possible towards the customer to say, hey, this happened, we put those measures in place. And it all comes down to basically writing post-mortems, um, where like something happened, you basically write a post-mortem to figure out what, what went wrong. A few weeks ago, we had an issue, it was happily not our issue, um, where our infrastructure provider rolled out a firewall change. And it was like a no-brainer. It was a change from a value from 500 to 1,000. And it was like everybody of the team, even we, said That's, that should not have had an, issue, an, an effect and it crashed the whole storage cluster. So we needed to, like, or provider needed to basically reboot the whole storage cluster. And we were like, oh, yeah, we 
that, that backfired. And it's actually a kernel bug now. So we found a kernel bug by, by doing that. Um, we also have other customers that say, we can run it your own. And our team goes, yes, you can. Fantastic. We have people that run their own OpenShift clusters and run Lagoon. We don't have any data on how many there are, but we had people basically coming into our rocket chat and saying, hey, um, I run a cluster and uh, I have a question about it. And our team was like, oh, yeah, that's cool. How can we help you? So it's, it's really cool to see that people just are starting to adopt the whole thing. So let me talk about good things. One of the best things, really, I think, is that the whole development happens in the open. So everybody can see or, or board. Priorities are more or less clear. Um, a lot of stuff, a lot of features are dictated by where the project is heading and what customer features we need. So we are adding up uh, features, for example, the new backup system that was a uh, a need by one of our bigger customers, and we started implementing that, and now we plan to roll it out onto all of our um, locations. So that's a cool thing. Um, as I work a lot in, in support, like having all the issues people can run into or run into on a daily base in the open helps basically finding the critical ones. If you have an issue or if you roll something out and you suddenly have an issue that happens like two, three times a day, you know, oh, we broke something there. Or you can also like find, what I do a lot is basically finding issues that are most likely due to not proper documentation because something changed over the time and we didn't adapt the documentation. So if I get a question a lot, we just look into, okay, where it's actually coming from. So we try to optimize on that. And we also had customers helping all the customers in GitHub. It was like, hey, I tried this and this worked. And we were like, okay, that's cool. Can you also create that in a pull request and make it to the documentation? They were like, yeah, sure, I'm on it. So that's really cool when you can basically collaborate also on these parts. We have a public roadmap. So we are always, um, several times a year, we are publishing a blog post where it's going, uh, where the project is going, so that's really cool. We have an idea space, so early on we had somebody who said, hey, it's cool that you have this Lagoon thing, but we would really like to have this on plain Kubernetes. And it took us like a little bit of time to basically arrive at the conclusion that we can do it. So we're currently looking into basically going from OpenShift to plain Kubernetes, or also allowing that. So that's also really cool that you have basically the needs of your customers or of anybody who wants to do something with the project, that they can air their voice and basically say, hey, we, we want to do that. How can we collaborate? Um, and it also leads to more interaction. You saw it's like a lot of tickets, a lot of chat. So it's really, it helps you communicate and solve the problem. Sometimes I say I'm like the, for some of our customers, I'm like the, the person that just not sits in their office but is there every day if they have an issue. So that's really fun. We also have some challenges. So when we uh, open sourced the whole thing, somebody came up like, but that's cool, you're an open source project, but why is there a company name all, all over it? We're like, yep, sure, we fixed that. So we basically did more or less search replace over the whole project, the test suite passed and we merged it in and everything runs. So we basically got rid of the company name because it should be an open source project. It's not just run by MACIO. And then we have also some challenges. So we have a lot of like, when you run an open source project, you have a lot of people that think, hey, it should be this way. Um, and you also need to tell them, like, if somebody comes with a great idea, you, I just tell them, hey, write down exactly what it, like, if it's a bug, if it's a feature, write down how it should be and how it should behave, and we can find a way to make it happen. Um, and oftentimes it's like, eh, it's not that big of an issue. But if you have somebody that has, like, proof that it should be in a different way and your project should hand, uh, handle something in a different way, you can actually like 
collaborate on that too. Um, another thing is that not everybody is happy with like having their names or their actions all in the open. For that, we are free to basically tell them, hey, you can file a ticket and we, like that's private. It's like also how security stuff is disclosed to us. That doesn't happen in, in GitHub. That happens via a security email address where you can basically, where we can have a security concern closed before we roll out the patch. So we, we have those two ways because sometimes people are like, eh, I don't want to be on, like be visible in that. Um, and one thing is you need to think through your code more than if it's like a closed source project. In a closed source project, you go like, oh yeah, it's a hack, we can do it that way. But the way we work or the way like when you do it for like a multitude of customers that run your project, you're not just doing a hack because it immediately either of like most of the time it doesn't even pass the pull request like the the code review then somebody says yeah but let's do it nicely um, but you really think your code through you think about the implications your changes have and you also do um, basically better documentation on it basically saying oh yeah we do this and if you upgrade from this version to this version you need to do this we are a little bit burned by that because we had some breaking changes in the past, but we are basically improved on that because we saw, okay, we didn't expect that much fallout from it, so we try to be better with that. Another challenge is putting a price tag on open source work. Somebody, like sometimes customers come in and say, we need feature X, Y, Z. We need to have failover cluster. We need to have, I don't know, Dream something up, like the, the ideas are, are crazy. Um, and then it's sometimes hard to put um, a price tag on it because um, like it's open source in the end. And they say they could do it in this time, and we say, but yeah, we have a process and it needs to be tested, it needs to be specified. Um, so it's, it's like hard to do it just in like, just nailing a price. Um, Another fun thing is, and that's like an endless uh, like discussion, should we have um, tag deployments? And it's like, everybody's like, yeah, I want to deploy tags. And at some point, like when we reach discussion of like, okay, how should it work? Everybody is like, oh, I don't know. So it's really hard to basically, some, some features are really wanted, but nobody can really describe how they should work. So we're currently working on that. So let me give you a little bit of an inside view what happened over the past two years. So we closed 565 pull requests. That's a lot. Um, currently, we have 108 open issues because I opened one before the talk. Um, but we also have 260 closed ones. And we have actually 69 forks. So from those 69s, there are a few people that started building up stuff based on our code, which is really awesome. And they also run their, their own lagoon. Um, but at some point they are like, yeah, probably we shift back to basically running your lagoon, but we want to have our work, which we put in, basically also having back, uh, committed back to the, the lagoon itself. Um, and we have... 39 contributors, and there are a lot of them. Some of them are in the room. Um, it's fun because I, for me personally, it's something cool when you can basically tell people, hey, if you see something that's broken, just fix it. Like we had Dan that basically went through the whole documentation and spell checked the whole thing. It was a huge commit. Um, we had people just adapting like some parameters or like just like the challenge of, yeah, it shouldn't be too bi too hard. And then somebody jumps up and say, yeah, I think I can do that. I, I always wanted to like try something out. So it's really cool that we have people that just volunteer their time or try to solve the issues they see in the daily work with the product, um, basically helping. And probably you already heard that when it comes to Drupal, so there is no contribution that is too small. It can be from flagging issues, to testing, to discussing features. 
um, we had a few features that have like long discussions. So sometimes we have people, they will not in the end implement it, but they have like a valid reason to be part in the discussion. So that's also really cool. Um, and one thing I, I do currently a lot is basically fixing and enhancing the documentation. And it's really cool that we also have other people like looking closely at the ever-growing documentation markdown files and looking into it. So two years, what, what, do, we, what do we see from it? Uh, we see that people want to use an open source hosting platform. Um, it's kind of ex uh, exceeding our expectations because we found a few customers and we won a few projects because they say everything is open source. Everything in, that, in our stack can be like looked at the code. Everything can be audited. We can change it as we please. We can help you making it better. So that's really cool. Um, and it's also much more about just seeing the code because in the end, in the beginning we were like it makes it much easier to pass security tests because in in the past when we had a security audit they always like some of them demanded root access and we were like nope you're not getting root access for doing a security thing so what we did back then is basically building up another production environment basically full blown set of servers and letting them like trash the whole thing and basically come up with their findings. And now that it's open source, they can basically start the, it their own. They find much more interesting bugs than the normal system probing you usually do. We saw bugs this close to, or like security stuff which we fixed uh, this close to us, which is much more complex than what we had when people were just having like the finished system. Um, and we also have a quite good share of pull requests that come in on a weekly basis, where we basically merge we merge them in once a week, um, and we also did some changes now that we can be the master branch, like the the most up to date bleeding edge, can be merged faster because we implemented a few things um, now in January and February. Um, everything happens in the open. Like, there is not really a lot of red tape that is not visible, um, unless all things that concern security, those are handled internally because it's security stuff. Um, another thing that I saw uh, is it's really cool to hire people with a strong background on open source. We have people on the team, they do open source work since years, and they're like, oh, that's cool. I always, like, I can make what I love as my day job because it basically pays the bills. Um, we also have a lot of learning. So as I said earlier, like good documentation is key to most answers and questions. Um, and I approach that by basically going after like which questions do we hear a lot and basically addressing those in the documentation. It's, it has like two, three small box that I went through and discussed every week twice, and now I can just <laughs> say, hey, it's in the documentation. Or for example, go lives, people, like everybody loves doing projects, but when it comes to go life, there is that thin line where it's like, okay, what's DNS? What do we need to do? And we have SSL certificates and this and that. And we basically wrote down like most of the knowledge we have or all of the knowledge we have about what do you need to do during a go life. And now we can just say, hey, read through that page. Do you feel safe after reading through that? Did you tick all the boxes to do a go live? Um, we learned that change logs are very, very important. We did a more or less good job on it, but we had a few releases without change logs. Of course, one of those without change logs um, had a few bugs, and since then we learned and adapted our processes. So if you do, like it starts not just by doing a release, it starts much earlier. So every change, every pull request has a classification what the change is. Is it a fix? Is it a documentation change? Is it a feature? Um, and then also a text that says what is changed and if it's a breaking change, how do, do you, like, how do you handle that if you run into that, to that issue? With all those informations, 
or all this information, we basically generate the change logs. So every pull request that's merged in adds up to our change log and it makes it much easier for us and for everybody who uses the system to understand like what changed and how can I deal with those changes. Um, so pull requests and issue templates help a lot because it adds that little bit of detail of basically guiding the user to basically tell them, hey, we need this information to actually go through and understand your problem. Um, and one thing that we just came up with um, or finally implemented is the whole versioning of the images. So if you run on, on the latest version, you can still use the latest Docker images. If you want to nail down on one specific version, you can basically say which version tag Docker image you want to use. This helps you to basically prevent certain issues that happen during an update. Um, we are still like improving on monitoring on that because if there is a security update, um, we will run into the problem that we cannot overwrite your configuration. So it's like, it's a thin line. So for 99% of the customer base, it will be okay to use the latest tax, but there is probably 1% that will have like it fixed down two versions. Yeah, I want to end on a, on, a, on a note and we can have a little bit of a discussion afterwards, but really ask yourself if others could benefit from the code you write every day if you just open source it. Um, because I think that's one of, the, one of the big things that are really cool of like giving people the ability to just base up on your code and do something even cooler with it. Um, yeah, and in the end, your code that you write could be the shoulder somebody stands on in the future, basically helping them to go farther with whatever your project does. Thank you.